And there's more oh, explosions there's, oh, right now. Hold on, people are running. Wait, hold, so hold on. on just a moment. We've got an explosion inside. She's been honoured for her contribution to CNN's September 11 coverage. Professor Jennifer Thomas weighs in this week on the changing global media landscape. With the 2019 elections fast approaching, just how ready is the Independent Electoral Commission when it comes to warding off digital attacks? The Proteas celebrate their diverse team makeup through a new campaign and an incredible collaboration between top creative minds seems the birth of a powerful anti-poaching television commercial. Jennifer Thomas is assistant professor at Howard University in the United States and a former CNN journalist. She's played a vital role in the network's coverage of major news stories and was honored with recognition from the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences for her contribution to CNN's September 11 coverage. So, in this era of fake news, not only in the United States, but right here and contested opinions, where the media is under immense pressure, I'm wondering how the landscape has changed. Professor Thomas has been in South Africa as a guest of Media Monitoring Africa and joins me now on Mags on Media. Let's wade straight into Donald Trump. Thank the you. craft of journalism, the strategy, the approach, how has it changed in the past two years? I think over the past two years, it has made journalists take a closer look at what our purpose is and then to approach what we do and how we prepare to do our jobs as journalists. I think it's made us up the ante, so to speak, to be better prepared before we cover a story, to make sure that we're checking our sources. And it's because a lot has been called out upon what journalists don't do. We're imperfect people, it's an imperfect uh, industry, as you know, but our goal is still to defend the public's right to know. And regardless of what may be happening or swirling around outside of that, I think we have to just stay true to what that mission is. You ultimately. talk about reevaluating our purpose. Um, the purpose, as you rightly say, hasn't changed. Have we perhaps in this profession worldwide lost sense of that purpose? I think in a way we have. And I think the reason is because of the influx of social media. All of the networks and the journalists, they're so quick to jump to be first to get the story, to spread it out so that you get that push button first on the story that a lot of times we're losing some of those basic things that we do like fact check, like get more than one source before we report a story. So I think in that way, it's, it's pushing us to be a little more sloppy and what's being done, and I think that's what needs to change, and that's why I say go back to the basics. Which, Jennifer, is driven, regrettably, by the competitive nature of Absolutely. this business, is that mm -hmm. if these days, if you're not first to the story on social media, your audience, which has diminished attention anyway, is going elsewhere, that often has an impact on the profitability of a media company. How do you win this war? Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there's a really right or wrong way. All I know is that we still have to do the story right because our credibility is all that we have, right? So once we lose that, if it's by inaccurate reporting or sloppiness, then that's gonna cause uh, others to change the channel or go to somewhere else and get their news. So I think if we stay true to doing the story right and try to do the story right and be first, then that will, you know, the domino effect will be there and it will help affect the bottom lines with the ratings and, and such. And that's a noble intention as yes, far as uh, people like you and I are concerned who are dyed-in-the-wool journalists. But does the audience care in this era of fake news? Aren't I, they more driven by radical opinion? Well, we have too much opinion-based yeah. news, yeah. in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually think that we don't give our audience as much credit as we should. Of course, you have those who just enjoy seeing the talking heads and the back and forth. And the, the spectacle. Yeah. Yes, the spectacle of it all. But I think when we think about it and when it all comes down to it, people really want to know. These are issues that matter to people. These are issues that affect people's lives and their families' lives. And that's something that we cannot forget, you know, as we get caught up in all of the antics of everything else. So I really think that we don't give our audiences enough credit. Mm. Do you think? audience trust in the media has uh, diminished. There's a well-known uh, uh, 
story in South Africa right now about a major Sunday newspaper mm -hmm. having to issue an apology. I don't want to get into that now. Right. You'll be aware of the background, yes, I'm sure. Time, um, similar mistakes, clangers have been made by the American media, which Donald Trump has called out. What about that erosion of trust and how do we win it back? There is an erosion of trust. We have journalists. We have wannabe journalists, we have citizen journalists. And when we talk about the audience, a lot of times they don't know the difference. They know someone is reporting something, whether it's real, whether it's a misinformation of the facts, and it's hard to decipher between what's real and what's not. It sounds like an old record, but I always go back to the fact that the true journalist has to do the job and has to do the job right. Because right now we are at an all time low in the US in terms of trust of the media. A lot of it is self-inflicted. And so that's why I say we have to go back, whether we're being called out by the commander in chief or by um, people who now have a distrust and a dislike of the media. We have to just kind of ignore the fray and stick to what it is we have to do. And I think in the end, um, hopefully, uh, we will gain that trust back by accurate reporting, by investigative journalism, and stop trying to be celebrities by, you know, in, in our roles as journalists, because now a lot of journalists are, they're on the talk shows, they're, in which nothing is wrong with that, but we sometimes lose what we're here to do. We're not here to be the next celebrity. There's a fourth strand to that, surely, and mm -hmm. that is investment. Mm -hmm. uh, we have yeah. seen around the world, and again, very noticeably in, in this country, diminishing resources within the newsroom. Mm -hmm. When I started out in newspapers just after Gutenberg invented the press, <laughs> um, there were beat reporters, yes. a crime reporter, a labor reporter, a court reporter. You know, newsrooms were heaving with specialists. Where have they gone? Yeah, the beat reporter is no longer there. And it's a problem because in the States, and I guess around the world, we are called to just be multimedia journalists, mm -hmm. right? We have to do it all. The ones that we're training now to enter the industry, they have to write, they have to edit, they have to shoot, they have to be able to put something online, put it on social media, make it all make sense and make it in, under deadline. And those of us who started a long time ago, we could focus on one thing. But I think that just calls us to be smarter, to do our research because we can't just focus on education now, to your point. We may be that one reporter. Um, a lot of newsrooms don't have studios like this anymore. There's that one camera. There's a, a TriCast or something that's doing the whole studio for itself. Uh, the presenter is doing multiple roles. So we have to, um, as we're training these journalists, make sure that they're prepared to do everything. But then for those of us who are in the industry, we just have to be more educated and really stick to what it is that we're here to do um, to inform and to educate um, others. And it's a, li a little easier said than done, but that's the world in which we live. Can we talk about you for a moment? Ah, sure. um, can we go back to 9-11? <laughs> yes. Uh, the work that you did. Um, yes. Just take us back in history. How did you approach that story? So on September 11th, I was a 9 a.m. show producer at CNN. And we know the first Trade Center was hit just before 9 a.m. In New York. In New York. Yeah. I was at the world headquarters in Atlanta, yeah. which is where our newscast was yeah. produced. We were preparing for the show. It was a very, as we say, slow news day. Mm. And one point of uh, historical fact people don't know, our story we were gonna do as our kicker was the fact that Michael Jordan was supposed to announce that he was coming back to the NBA. As you said, yes. important, but a slow news. Right, yeah. slow news day. So we had this whole thing set up at the end with our anchor Leon Harris, Darren Kagan were the anchors in Atlanta. So that was supposed to be our, our fun story we were gonna end the show with. So we were just you know waiting to go on air. It was a beautiful day. And then we heard what sounded like um, thunder coming down the steps in the back of the newsroom. We had our set in the middle of the newsroom and it was from the editorial meeting saying something happened. We think a plane hit the World Trade Center. So of course, as the producer and as journalists, we just I grab my headsets, get my notepad and we run into the control room. And we were there for the next several hours. Thankfully, you know, we had the video and the broadcast from our affiliates in New York that kept us going while we were trying to determine what happens. And it's really sort of the, I guess, the magic of television for those who are behind the scenes that know how it come together because there's chaos, there's confusion. You're fearful because, you know, I started thinking of the friends that I had in New York, but you, of course, have to put all of that to the side. So it was just, what can we report? But then we also had those dramatic and tragic images that were coming in, and we were on the back row queuing, re-queuing video and then you start questioning, what is it 
what can we show? You know, there's death and tragedy, but it's happening. You know, that's truly breaking news where in the past we would never show images of anyone falling off of a building. Mm -hmm. But um, everything was happening so much at the same time. And of course, we had correspondence at the State Department, at the White House, um, at the Pentagon. We were all on phones, uh, on conference calls, trying to determine what to cover next. And then we brought in, we had two new correspondents that day, Paula Zahn and Aaron Brown, who were just starting that day on the air in New York. So we were working with them. Um, in our control room in New York. So we continued, uh, this went on for of course days and weeks. It was a hard time. We weren't, as we say, uh, boots on the ground there, but we were there. We were uh, controlling what was going out on the air and it was, um, it was very traumatic. They, they brought counselors in for us. Some people weren't able to take the pressure. And honestly, I couldn't really talk about it until the 10 year anniversary when I was teaching at Clark Atlanta and we kind of just focused on the anniversary. So it was definitely a day I'll never forget, but it taught many lessons about getting the news out, but yet remembering there's a human element behind all that. These are people's lives that were being affected. So yeah, definitely a day I'll never forget. Jennifer Thomas, thank you. Thank you. The Proteas celebrate diversity through a new campaign under the slogan, hashtag worn as one. And who are South Africa's top performing brands and agencies? Find out next when Mags on Media continues.